Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. Broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world, we're bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter and on TikTok. Folks, please do send us your comments. Please tell us where you are coming from. And we wish you a very happy St. David's Day on this, the 1st of March. St. David, one of the great British saints of our islands. So, a special greeting to you tonight if you're Welsh or watching from Wales. Now, we're going to be talking about, obviously, the crazy carry-on with the SNP leadership contest. Now, none of these people are going to be good for the United Kingdom. Send us your thoughts on who happens, though, to be your preferred candidate and why. Is it Hamza Yusuf, Ash Regan or Kate Forbes? And isn't it amazing how quickly we forget about Nicola Sturgeon? How Nicola Sturgeon, when she was reigning, she was not Scotland, and she still is not Scotland. And, you know, I saw a tweet from her today, and I was like, who's this person? Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, yeah, yeah. What what are you still doing around, you know? How quickly politics changes, how quickly politicians fall out of fashion, how quickly we forget about them. So if you've forgotten about Nicholas Sturgeon, good for you, because we're almost there. Now, good evening to who was first in tonight? It was TC, wasn't it? Good for TC. And also there was uh, Derek Hart. Good evening, Alistair, and to everyone who's watching tonight. It's time to put the great back into Great Britain once again. Neil on TikTok says he doesn't want any of them. Perfectly understandable. Good evening to Debbie on YouTube and to AR Entertainment. Hello, everyone. And to everyone watching from Wales. He gives a Welsh greeting. What does that Welsh greeting mean, sir? Adam says, hello from Leicestershire. If there's anyone watching from Wales... Happy St. David's Day. That's what that means. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Slim says, good evening. Big crowd in tonight. And hello to to Kat. Good stuff. Good stuff. Paul says, good evening from the Garden of England. And Paul made a good point to us uh, this week about the census that was taken in England and Wales and the extent to which those who identified as British only shot up from something like 19% to something like almost 39% or more. Don't have the figures directly on me. Paul can correct me, no doubt. And essentially, this was simply because of the way that the question had been worded this time around in the census. As for the Scottish census, who knows whatever happened to that. They tried, the SNP tried in its normal way of trying to do something and failing entirely. And as far as we know, the Scottish census, because so few people actually responded to it, it became almost unworkable and un, un, um, uh, uh, it became s- such that there was really no point to it because enough people had not actually responded to it. Another typical SNP fail And uh, shame on the British government for devolving that essential power to the band of numpties at Holyrood. What a pity that they did that, because it means that our statistics in Scotland are simply not up to scratch. But that's what that's what happens when you do that. Good evening to to Alan and Slim says Kate Forbes would be Slim's choice. And we were thinking about that as well. And let me just talk about that. 
Very interesting article, several articles actually in the Sunday National. Interesting from a unionist perspective. And they interviewed Hamza Yusuf. And he, in this article here, it says, one SNP source claimed that the Greens would immediately quit the coalition if Kate Forbes won the election. And they asked Yusuf for his opinion on this, and he said, a minority government would be disastrous. I've been part of a minority government before. You have to battle day by day to get your policy and legislation through the Scottish Parliament. He painted a picture of a new SNP leader casting their Scottish Green colleagues aside before trying to get MSPs to vote for them to become First Minister. Now, if we become ungovernable, Yusuf said, we become unelectable. There's no way that's going to help us grow the independence movement by any stretch of the imagination. I'm unapologetic and I'm unashamedly supportive of the deal we have with the Greens. So basically, Hamza Yusuf is saying that if Kate Forbes was elected, it's almost certain that the Greens would split from the coalition. And in fact, the Scottish administration under the SNP would become, as to use his phrase, ungovernable and unelectable. So that says to me that as unionists, we would want Kate Forbes to be the person that is elected because it would mean that the Greens, the Green Goblins, the Green Gimps would break up the coalition and that would be bad for the SNP. So in that sense, she's probably the one that one would prefer. I think if Yusuf were to be elected, it would just be the same old SNP that would just, just continue on. And um, it seems, though, that, that Forbes is actually the favourite among the membership. And what was also interesting here was an, an analysis of the SNP membership. It says here, SNP membership not as socially liberal as might be assumed. Experts weigh in on party makeup. And this tends to reflect things that, that I've known in my own personal experience. And it says here, according to research, most members of the SNP are in the 50 to 64 year old category. That's 40% of them, while 31% are over 65. So in other words, that's 71% of the SNP membership are over 50. In terms of younger members, 26% are aged 25 to 49, while just 3% are 18 to 24 year olds. And it doesn't say how many of the SNP membership are actually male versus female. Oh, hang on, it does. It's about 60% male, 40% female. And it's very skewed, quote, towards middle class membership. That's something I've always, I've always known just by the SNP people that I know. Not as maybe socially liberal as might be assumed, therefore more likely perhaps to vote for Kate Forbes. And you find that with party members membership is that the MSPs and the MPs of all these parties, they're all socially liberal, they're all woke, they all go along with the trends of the day, but the actual membership is very often a completely different beast altogether. Alan says they're refusing to release updated membership figures. That's interesting. Talking about membership, Rob John's professor of politics at the University of Essex said research which he carried out, which will be published in a new book, exploded some of the myths about the surge in SNP and Green supporters after the 2014 referendum. That's what I like. I love a book that explodes myths. They're the best kind of books. He says, Quote, a lot of people suggested the sudden influx of members post-2014 was people who had been massively activists during the independence campaign and were really going to transform the party. Whereas what we found is that actually there were just lots of people who were for independence who were frustrated and thought, this is something I can do, but didn't have much ambition to be active in the parties. 
And this is relevant to the leadership election, as sometimes people overstate the activist and impatient nature of the SNP membership and even their political interest. There are even people who joined the party twice as they had forgotten they had joined it. (laughs) So a lot of these people won't vote in the leadership election. A lot will vote, but without having paid that much attention to what's going on, let alone obsessing about the strategy for independence. And in that sense, there are more swing voters than we might expect, as members are not all as politically obsessive as we sometimes think. That's absolutely so. That's absolutely so. We shouldn't imagine everybody who's a member of the SNP or indeed any political party is really that much is is really heavily engaged in politics. Sometimes it's just it's just a gesture that they make, because as he says here, it's something they can do. Hey, Emma. Hope things are well with you. Becky thinks probably correctly that membership figures will have dropped massively. Oh, undoubtedly. The the high watermark, Becky, was immediately after the 2014 referendum when they got a big um, uh, influx of these people there that I've been talking about. But such people have just dropped away and they'll be dropping away further. Derek says that he's surprised that there are not that many young members. So is I. As I say, 3% of members of the SNP are just aged 18 to 24 Three percent. I mean, that's hardly any. That will be the same as probably the other political parties. In fact, <clears throat> I would imagine from what I've seen that the Scottish Conservatives have actually got more younger people than that in their in their ranks. Rob says he's surprised to see that SNP membership is generally socially conservative. Well, certainly, I knew. SNP members who were SNP members because they thought that if Scotland got independence, they'd be able to to keep the immigrants out. And um, there's there's still a level of SNP membership who believe that. They don't seem to realise that's the last thing the SNP would do if, uh, if they got their way. It would be like open borders, you know. So these there's a lot of naivety as well among the membership. And a lot of... Um, kind of very fairy notions a lot of very fairy notions and that's actually a good a good point to bring in this next point in the same same newspaper as well it's the only newspaper i read these days isn't that isn't that absurd the sunday national and the national is the only newspaper i read because at least i know that I, i'm disagreeing with it at least i know it's not trying to get something over on me all the other newspapers are trying to like promote lies basically but at least I know what I've got when I'm reading The National. I know I don't agree with it. Yes, this is actually a good time for a busting indie myth, part 23. Busting indie myths, part 23. And we are busting indie myths on the daily, weekly, monthly and yearly until the Scott Nats see clearly that we're down with the capital A to the double F, G. And in this busting indie myth, I'm going to address the idea that a separated Scotland would somehow offer more democratic opportunity to us in order to shape our country and transform our future. Well, how so? Okay, the fact is we'll have less democratic opportunity. Let me explain. And this thought was was uh, kick-started by this woman's comment here. Let's think about the kind of leader that this party needs. And it's written by a woman called Julie Hepburn. And I googled her and all I could find out about her was that she's married to Mr Hepburn, who is an MSP for the Scottish National Party. Anyway, she has written here that, quote, at the heart of the independence movement is a desire for change, to give the people of Scotland the opportunity to shape our future and transform our country for the better. Well, do you know what? I'm down with that. I'm down with shaping our future and transforming our country. What an exciting thought. That's fantastic. Count me in. Count me in for shaping our future and transforming our country. But what I would ask is, what does that actually mean in practice? What is it that we'll actually be doing to shape our future and transform our country when you, Mrs. Hepburn, and your crazy friends 
get their way and divide us against the rest of the British people, okay? How will we be actually shaping our country and transforming our future? Well, I'll tell you what exactly it would mean in practice. It would mean that, get this, right? Once every five years, you and I will have the opportunity to walk round the corner to the polling station and vote at a Holyrood election. That is how, in practice, I will be shaping my future and transforming our country, or shaping our country and transforming our future, no matter how you want to describe it. In other words, we'll be doing exactly what we do just now. We'll be doing no more than what we do just now. We'll be voting once every five years at a Hollywood election. We'll be doing no more than what we do at present. But here's the thing. We'll be doing much less also. Because guess what? In your new transformative country, you and I are not going to have a chance anymore to vote to shape the rest of the British Isles and to transform the rest of the British Isles. We're not going to have a say in shaping the rest of the landmass that we live on. We're not going to have a say in transforming the rest of the landmass that we live on. So in other words, we will be able to do what we're doing at the moment, which is voting at Holyrood, but we're not going to be able anymore to vote at the British level. So in fact, we will not have more democratic opportunity in a separated Scotland, we will have exactly less democratic opportunity. We will have one parliament taken away from us. We will have one area of our country that we can no longer vote for and we can no longer attempt to change or transform or to shape. So don't tell me that your separated Scotland is going to give me all these new democratic opportunities. It won't be any more than what we've got at present, and it will be much less than what we've got at present. So here endeth Busting Indie Myths, part 23. Had to get that off my chest, seriously, because I'm fed up with all that airy-fairy, it's all going to be wonderful. Well, okay, what does it mean in practice? Tell me what it means in practice. Well, all that as well. All of that. And all it was basically is Hums is the man that's going to bring us all together and he's going to transform our future. I write. I'm sure he will not. Thank you, Catherine. TC says that the SNP showed themselves up big time in Westminster today. Absolute clowns. I didn't, uh, I don't know to what you're referring, TC now, Paul answered the question here that I mentioned about British identity, that in England and Wales at the latest census, 54% identified as British in 2021, as British only. A huge increase from 19% in 2011 at the census prior, 10 years prior. And that's just because they presented the question in a more accurate manner and that shows the importance of questions doesn't it just show the importance of questions and that's why we've always got to be skeptical about opinion polls as well because you can ask a question a leading question and you can basically get people to answer the way that you necessarily want so even opinion polls that work for us we've got to be careful about how the question was uh, asked as well MAK says keep the union absolutely and also says Scottish British and proud now I was talking about how the question was answered there today the 1st of March is an auspicious day of course because it is um, St David's Day but quite a lot happened on this day in British history and something that happened that many of us have absolutely forgotten about is that there was a referendum in Wales and there was a referendum in Scotland back in 1979 on this day in British History Matters. Isn't that interesting? Okay, it was the Callaghan government 
and they were pushing they were pushing uh, devolution for reasons best known to themselves and they had they ch- they chose to do the referendum on the 1st of march okay in wales so don't tell me that they didn't figure out oh let's do it on st david's day obviously that was one of the reasons that they did it and we've got the results of that welsh referendum back in 1979 and it's really quite remarkable that's the scottish one we'll put up the the welsh one uh, we'll talk about the scottish one in a minute but there you go okay the question was do you want the provisions of the wales act 1978 to be put into effect now 20 percent said yes on a 59 percent turnout Okay, so that 20% who said they wanted a Welsh Assembly, essentially, works out at 12% of the entire Welsh electorate. 12% of the entire Welsh electorate. Okay, so, in other words, 88% of the Welsh electorate in 1979 did not want a Welsh Assembly or couldn't be uh, motivated to get out of bed to vote for it. So that's, that's actually very interesting. Okay, now that would also be due to the fact that the Labour government at the time was also split on that and a lot of the Labour MPs did not want a Welsh Assembly including interestingly enough Neil Kinnock and I was researching this today and I'm just going to say this because it's a bit politically incorrect but but Kinnock says his view was that quote between the mid 16th century so that's like the 1500s and the mid 18th century which is to say the 1700s This is Kinnock, right? Wales had practically no history at all. And even before that, it was the history of rural brigands who have been ennobled by being called princes. (laughs) That that wouldn't go down very well today. But that's quite funny that he said that. The history of rural brigands who have been ennobled by being called princes. He was one of six South Wales Labour MPs who opposed their own government's plans along with Leo Abbs, I remember him, Donald Anderson, Ian Evans, Fred Evans, and Ivor Davis. And then, of course, when they had another referendum back in 1999, they just, the, 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 uh, the yes side barely got enough. It was just a few thousand votes that they got over the no side. And, of course, Blair just railroaded the thing in anyway. <clears throat> and on the same day, on the same day, today 1st of May 1979 was the Scottish referendum for devolution let's look at the figures for that and that was slightly different the the yes to having a Scottish assembly was 51 51.6 and the no's were at 48.4 and so a small number there wanted it but that did not go into effect because a threshold had been set. Okay, now I'm all for thresholds at these kind of referendums and the threshold at both the Welsh and the Scottish referendum in 1979 was that 40% of the entire electorate had to vote for the proposition. And it was felt that, and 40% is very modest, It should really be 50% plus one of the entire electorate. But they set it at 40%, good thinking, 40% of the entire electorate had to vote for the proposition before it would be carried forward. That's called a threshold. And even though the yes side marginally won in Scotland, that still only worked out at 33%, one third of the entire Scottish electorate. So it fell short of the 40% threshold which was required. And so I'm very glad about those thresholds. And we've talked about thresholds as well and the importance of them in our magazine, Do More Together, where we say ensure breaking up is hard to do. Breaking up is hard to do. And you have to set a threshold in order to ensure that there are sufficient number of people who are sufficiently motivated and that there's essentially a a majority of people who want the actual thing. Not just a majority of those who vote on the day, but an actual majority of the entire people as measured by the entire 
electorate. And we had one man to thank for that 40% rule, and that was George Cunningham. And we have a picture of George here, who was a Labour MP. And he was a Scotsman. He was born in Dunfermline, but he he was an, a Labour MP for a London constituency. That's him there, good old George Cunningham. Uh, the nation owes him a debt, quite frankly, for he did not believe that there were sufficient people in Scotland, and certainly not in Wales, who wanted what was being proposed. And so it was he who brought in and argued passionately for the threshold. And he was backed up in that aim by Neil Kinnock also. Okay, so that's a fascinating thing as far as referendums in the British Isles is concerned that happened on this day back in 1979, St. David's Day as well. And we can learn from that. And goodness me, God forbid, if there were to be another referendum and things like thresholds really do need to be considered because we've got people like Ash Regan, who is not going to win the the SNP leadership contest. But she's saying silly things like... Uh, all you need is 50% of the people who vote on the day plus one. Well, goodness me, these are, I mean, especially a Scottish election where virtually nobody votes anyway, then you'd end up with a very small number of people um, supporting the idea of destroying the United Kingdom. I say where almost nobody votes, the average of a Holyrood election, the, the average of the last five Holyrood elections there, the average turnout is 54%, just a little over. So you've got Ash Regan saying that at a Holyrood election, you need 50% of the people who vote on the day plus one. Well, when you've only got a turnout of just a little over half, you'd be looking at something like 25% plus one of the entire electorate voting. And that's enough to destroy the United Kingdom? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Absolutely not. That that's also was on this day. What else happened on this day in British history? And how also happened? Yes, on this day in British history, 1st of March 1946, the British Central Bank was nationalised, which is to say the Bank of England as it is called, was nationalised by Clement Attlee's government, 1st of March 1946. And believe it or not, right, for the last 250 years prior to that, it was a private bank. It was established in 1692 by, among others, William Patterson, the uh, Scottish um, financier, he and his mates set it up. And it remained a private bank f from 1692 until 1946. It's incredible. All these years, a private bank was the actual national central bank for the United Kingdom. That's mad. That's mad. Anyway, eventually, eventually, um, Clement Attlee nationalised it. Um, but what he didn't do and what he missed the opportunity to do because of the absolute lack of imagination that plagues the Westminster political class is he did not properly change the name. And it should have, of course, been changed to something like the Bank of Britain or the United Kingdom Central Bank or what we prefer to call it, which is the BCB, the British Central Bank, because that is entirely exactly, particularly and specifically what it is. OK, and people say, well, why does that matter? Why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. It matters for lots of reasons. One, it matters because it is the fact of the matter. It is the British Central Bank. OK, it's the British Central Bank, so it should have a proper name. Um, secondly, it misleads a lot of Scottish nationalists, OK, who imagine that the Bank of Scotland is somehow equivalent to the Bank of England. A perfectly natural error. 
But the Bank of Scotland is not, of course. The Bank of Scotland is a private bank and its name derives from that period of time, hundreds of years ago, when you could name a private corporation after the name of the country. And it's a historical hangover, but it remains a private bank. It's not a national Scottish bank, nor for that matter is the Royal Bank of Scotland or indeed any other bank other than the Bank of England. All the banks are private banks, apart from the Bank of England, which is the National British Bank, misnamed. And so people then think, and Scottish nationalists then think, well, if we've got a Bank of Scotland note, why can't we just continue to have these after separation without realising that, no, because that's just a, that's, these are privately issued banknotes. Because what happens is if the, the Bank of Scotland wants to print off let's say a thousand fivers what it does is it gives five thousand pounds of its own money to the british central bank and the british central bank writes a wee notice that says you are allowed to print off a thousand five pound notes now we explain it all here in it's the british central bank which is one of our policies in our 40 page magazine do more together and God forbid, if there were to be a second referendum, the role of the Scottish currency and the role of the Bank of England will be central to that debate. And think about how that will sound, okay? Speaking about the importance of the Bank of England to Scotland's future is going to seem belittling to many Scottish people. And claiming that Scotland has to rely on the Bank of England is quite a different political message and is heard in quite a different way than pointing out the positive strength of the combined British Central Bank. Okay? Saying that Scotland must rely upon the British Central Bank sounds much preferable and is a much more powerful political message than the idea that Scotland's got to rely on the Bank of England, which to many people is just going to produce quite naturally a knee-jerk anti-English response. So these names and words matter. And we have pr we've promoted this idea of changing the name of the British Central Bank for years and years now, since we, even before we were established in 2012, we've been pushing that and sending letters and um, articles to the people in charge and uh, it has hasn't got us very far but at least we're making an effort you know what I mean so that's the point that I wanted to make so it was Clement Attlee's government that at least nationalized the bank but forgot to change the silly name Derek Hart says should be Bank of Britain that's a good one Bank of Britain that sounds powerful Christopher says, tell the Scott Nats about the 860 billion that the Bank of England paid out to bail the UK and save the banking system in 2008. Paul says something good here. He says, the bank has at least recently changed its imagery, branding it to look more British looking. That's right. It did that, didn't it? Yeah, that was a, that was a wee start. Absolutely. Alan says there's a good show out there about the inside the Bank of England, possibly on iPlayer. It explains how they back up all the money. Worth worth checking out. <laughs> Wonder what Ash's currency will be. Tomatoes. Yeah. Well, she said today was it that they were going to use the British currency for two months or something like that. I think she just makes up makes it up on the hoof what would happen is that BlackRock would step in and we would be run by the globalists. <clears throat> run by the globalists even more than we are at present, I think, Slim, the way things are going. Without the central bank, Scotland would be truly sunk with no lender of last resort. That's right. That's right. We do need a British central bank and it would just be good if it could be clarified as British rather than the as in holding itself out as something that it's not, because it's not actually the Bank of England. I mean, there is a case there that it's trading uh, under false pretenses, because it's the bank of all the United Kingdom. It's not just the Bank of England. So it's misrepresenting itself um, in the marketplace. And 
that that's that's uh, that's quite a relevant point actually we are always we are always trying to educate on this program and in this the 420th year of the union of the crowns we've been putting out articles and we're aiming to do a union heart dedicated to the 420th anniversary of the union of the crowns when the king james the sixth of scots became also the king of england and unified the crown in his person and during that time a lot of material was written encouraging james the sixth to go further and to aim for full political union and one of the documents written was called the british union and it was by a chap called david hume now this david hume is to be distinguished from a different david hume the one that most of us have heard of is the scottish enlightenment philosopher during the um uh, 1700s this particular david hume is um published this book in 1605 he published it in latin and it was translated here by these authors and this book is not cheap i was we got this several years ago and i was looking for it today on amazon and it's selling at about 120 quid so we got this in the office about uh, six years ago six seven years ago for less than that but it was still a hefty price that we paid but i was reading it again this week and some amazing stuff in it which i'm gonna which i'm gonna read out um but before i do that i just want to read here um about it uh, rutledge.com talks about it and says that the union insulae britannicae is a unique tract that urged the fusion of the scottish and english kingdoms into a new british commonwealth with a radically new british identity its scottish author david hume of godscroft was a major intellectual figure in jacobean scotland published in london in 1605 its publication was suppressed and it existed only in manuscript. This is the first translation and is breathtakingly contemporary in some of the proposals that it makes. So our job is to bring out this stuff that nobody else is going to see or hear or read and to bring out the wisdom in it for the benefit of others. And we published an article on it yesterday in fact and you'll find the link to that advocating the british union in 1605 you'll find the link to that in the threads but what i wanted to read was this bit which is really quite poetic and he's talking about the central argument the argument the bonds of union and this is the latin and this is the english there is one bond and one only The one principle to which you will rightly entrust the union is love. That's the beginning and the end and the touchstone of union. As Scalinger defines it, love is the feeling of which union is the name. We're going to use that. Love is the feeling of which union is the name. Surely love is our main road leading to the Union, and what's more, the surest way of preserving the Union. Love being constant, the Union stands firm. When love is removed, the Union falls apart. That's the way it is wherever we look, even in marriage, which is the most perfect kind of Union. When love is present, it lasts. Without love, it slips away. This is something we see every day. No laws, if there is no love present, can keep it from suffering harm. It is equally true that union is the road to love. This is clear from our associations with other people in everyday life, an informal sort of union, if you will, and yet it acquires significance by its influence on our affection for them. Similarly, justice is also the bond of love 
equality the principle that gives life to justice, and sincerity or candour the link that holds everything together without which there is neither love nor justice nor equality. These are the things which people want, what they are attracted by, which their loyalty is secured by for whatever needs doing. It's all like that. It's all like this. It's the most incredible document. Most incredible document. So we're going to be bringing out a lot of this as well. And he was, he was, he was overly Scottish as well, because what he wanted to do was he wanted the British flag simply to be the lion rampant. Which is also interesting because it that fits into another element which has been heavily suppressed during this time as well, which is that a lot of uh, religious people at the time saw it as a prophetic union, uh, a coming together, um, almost almost uh, biblical in a way, and of course the the lion rampant being the the lion of Judah. But that's a whole other area which we're going to develop in the coming months and years to come as well. And to bring out all of that stuff, because it's a fascinating area, which, as the Rutledge tract there says, has been largely suppressed. But I wanted just to read that out and put that down on record. Great little piece of piece of work. But, and this is what we're up against, isn't it, Becky? Hate. They're bringing in lots of hate. We're bringing in the love, okay? They're bringing in the hate and the division. And that's so, so sad. As Christopher says as, as well, hatred is the Scottish nationalist path. I was reading this chat, Matthew Lynn. He was... What is he saying here? SNP has no idea how to fix Scotland's broken economy. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> Telegraph 21st of February The proposals f put forward by the leaders are unfortunately all too familiar Put up taxes, spend more money, bash the English Put up taxes again, spend even more money Bash the English a bit more and blame everything on Mrs Thatcher While pointing out that she was English Repeat as necessary <laughs> That's uh, that's it. And um, I also want, while I'm at it, here to to read out parts of this article, taking a little bit of a turn here into another area. But this was a letter that was sent by one of our viewers to Robert Jenrick, MP, Minister of State for Immigration. And it's from one of our viewers. Dear sir, I am a Scottish Unionist. I'm slightly more open-minded on economic matters, although I consider myself a cultural conservative. It is annoying, therefore, to see the Conservative Party, whenever there is visible opposition to their spineless immigration policies, come up with the standard reaction and rant about how it is the quote-unquote far-right even when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, he described the patriotic lads who took on the idiots who were vandalising Winston Churchill's statue. He described them as bother boys. He goes on to say, I am unaware of any organised quote-unquote far right in the UK, as indeed are we. It's basically a myth that's been put together by the media and the government and strongly suspect that it is a fantasy thought up by the government and police. Well, you're absolutely right there. Immigration under Conservatives has increased in an indiscriminate matter and at transformative levels. I even read in today's newspaper that 90,000 immigration applications from Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Eritrea and Yemen are to be fast-tracked. You couldn't get worse places from which to find suitable migrants. A massive influx of large, sorry, a massive influx of young, largely unskilled and uneducated men from Africa and the Middle East with little or nothing in common with the native population is about as welcome as a hole in the head. Do you actually think this is a good thing? Well, 
I wonder what Robert Jenrick will say to that. I should imagine that all that will happen is that this person will be put on some kind of far right watch list. But I had to read that out because I thought that was quite funny. As welcome as a hole in the head. Utterly, utterly mad, the people who run us. And I want to just always remind people, especially on TikTok, just because we're unionists doesn't mean that we support what the British government happens to be doing half the time. Because the, the British government is very often as... Uh, as uh, as um, amateurish as the as the Scottish National Party as well. What's Graham saying? In the Republic of Ireland era, the two largest parties worked together to keep Sinn Féin out. Could the two major parties in Britain not come together just for one election, maybe as the UK party and get the SNP out and make Scotland united again? Well, that's uh, an interesting point of view, and it's kind of idealistic way of looking at things. Uh, in reality, the two major parties, which is to say Tory and Labour, are not going ever to come together on those sorts of things because they're just looking out from their point of view for themselves. But it would certainly be a way in maybe some areas, maybe in some constituencies it might be possible but um, it's always discussed but it never happens so it's in other words it's not something that one can put any sort of faith in ever happening but it's it it makes sense at a certain level doesn't it people do think though that the Labour Party is going to do better come next year's general election and I think they're probably right in that because the Conservatives haven't really produced anything noteworthy other than just a couple of years of fractious infighting and lockdowns. Harry says, don't rely on the politicians for the common ground of Britain. We should rely on the people within the union. That's why it's the people that have to stand up and be counted Becky says Mrs Thatcher would have chewed the SNP up and spat them out in bubbles. When she was around, the SNP were not as big as they were, as 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 they became. It was devolution that really propelled the SNP into the um, into a major political force. Prior to that, it was it it was fairly fringe in the sense of not really getting people elected only having handfuls of people elected to Westminster, but it was devolution that changed the, the power of the SNP entirely. Derek says, in the run-up to the 2014 referendum, Labour, Lib Dem and Conservative did unite in the sense of door-to-door -door posting leaflets and had meetings on a regular basis. That's a good point, Derek, that even if there's no ability to formally link up the activists still can link up at the grassroots and I was reading an article uh, today yesterday in the National and a person there was saying that the SNP and ALBA cannot realistically have any kind of formal dealings with each other but that does not stop their activists from supporting each other on the ground and linking up and that's probably the best that can be said is that while Labour, Tory and Lib Dems can't necessarily have a formal arrangement, the activists should at least be able to, to work together, as of course we already do. I mean, A Force for Good has got members of all political parties and none in, in our ranks. So there's nothing to stop people linking up, as you say, Derek, at that level. Thanks for pointing that out. Julia Ann says, can you give me any positives for staying in this union? Yes, we do. We have an article that's 57 positive reasons to stay in the union. And what we'll do, Julia Ann, is we'll put that up in our thread, which you'll find on our Facebook and Twitter threads. Harry says, shame that you missed the first half of the stream, but you can catch up by going to youtube.com forward slash UK a force for good where all our programs are listed and we're also on Odyssey Odyssey 
dot com, which is O D Y S E E. So we're on Odyssey, and all our material on YouTube also gets put onto Odyssey. So if you're on Odyssey, by all means, please do give us a follow on Odyssey. Odyssey is a fairly new platform and uh, doesn't have as many viewers or anything like that as YouTube. But there we go, odyssey.com, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. We're also on odyssey.com, so check that out. And that's odyssey.com forward slash at UK, a force for good. Ladies and gents, we're at the end of the show. So it just remains for me to say that we will be back next week at 7 until 8 p.m. So until then, God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. See you next week.